Story 1 The aliens tried to flank us through the valley. It was long, it was narrow, but our base had no room for artillery. Normal procedures would say that we deploy an arty company to keep the valley secured, rain down death on any infantry battalions that tried to flank us. Our base was too small for artillery, only room for the AA gun that kept the skies clear for our supply ships to drop off munitions and toilet paper. The MREs were great, but sweet shit did we eat through toilet paper when we had to shit. Now those are normal procedures before we had humans. You see there is an elite cast of humans who weaponize the most boring subject in any species school. Math. And we had one of them in our base. Her name was Sanchez. She was the mama eagle of our base. For a human, she was very attractive. Even in full military gear, her smile would light up our day. We called her Mama Eagle because she was a sniper. And while being a sniper may seem like you only shoot at enemies with a rifle, she did more. It was her and her spotter droid who calculated where the best infiltration and worst infiltration points in the valley was. It was her and her droid who made us plant claymores and mines in a four kilometer square around the base. And it was her who kept the valley clear. Not clean, but clear. Important distinction. Sanchez and her droid would watch the valley as our AA gun pummeled enemy gunships. Her eagle eyes could spot a tinge of purple skin in the green foliage, easier than a normal human can taste that the burger is a soy patty instead of whole beef. Instead of requesting our base be expanded, requiring a large number of resources to do so, she would just requisition a high-power anti-material rifle. In the far-flung future, where peace is maintained by the people with the best guns and expert soldiers, the 50 cal sniper is lacking. So the 90 cal was created dot 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 IT was 1.5x bigger than the 50. But what made it so dangerous is that it hit like a 90 thanks to the unique calamite metal used that made it heavier the farther it flew. Sanchez and her droid got in their spot as our AA and defenses made short work of any armored vehicle or infantry assault. She overlooked the valley, a pair of binoculars and a compass with a windometer. IDK, the thing that scans wind speed. Correct me in the comments, I'm too lazy to Google right now. Her droid would beep when it found an enemy. Hostile activity, grid Z6, it said. Sanchez loaded her magazine and racked the bolt. A 90 cal round chambered. Show mama her target, she said. A tinge of purple, and then another, and another dot dot dot. It was a full attack squadron, Sanchez got on her radio. Mama Eagle to base, I got a flanking force, permission to engage. Over, a short while later. Mama Eagle, this is base, you are clear. I repeat, send them away. And that is how snipers became feared. An artillery company was easy to evade. Why? You can hear the death whistling of their shells about to land on your position. It's traumatizing, but seeing swaths of your own men erupting in explosions can sometimes force your enemy to suicide charge your position, kicking and screaming. A sniper, on the other hand, was nothing but a crack in the wind, and a soldier drops dead. Psychologically, it's the same as an artillery shell, but with added horror. You heard it, but the person who died didn't. Instead of thinking an artillery shell lets you brace for impact, you won't hear yourself die. You won't be able to hear something. You just drop dead. The fear of knowing you are going to die is lesser compared to you not knowing you could die. A random chance instead of a guarantee. Is the rifle aimed at you? Your next squad mate? Your officer? You have no idea. The sniper can cherry pick all they want. Sanchez pulls the trigger. The bullet flies. The tungsten calamite bullet flies through the air, spinning. Its trademark crack is heard by the entire attacking enemy force, except the guy in the middle of the formation. He drops dead, a hole through his chest plate, through his heart, and blowing off the hand of the guy behind him before striking the stone on the ground, blowing it to pieces as rock shrapnel wounds nearby soldiers. The enemy soldiers look at their dead and wounded, all from one shot. The officer shouts for them to make through the treacherous valley faster, but the rest know that they could be next. It was an instant mutiny as the soldiers gunned down their officers and ran into the woods. Sanchez racks the bolt again, an empty casing jumps out, still smoking. Enemy force diverted away, she says over the comms. Good job, Mama Eagle, the base says.
Story 2. Jaxarak was a wanted immortal. For over 3,000 years, he pillaged, murdered, and violated the laws of many systems and empires throughout the galaxy's existence. His immortality made it hard to execute him or punish him with permanent prison time, since he would outlast the prison or empire, only to hide until he became a rumor before popping up like a bad pimple before your prom date in college. So he felt easy knowing that he was caught by humans for murdering over 4,000 colonists to see if humanity can actually punish him. The judge, known as Mary, looked at his heinous crime. So what's my punishment? Eternal imprisonment? He mockingly laughs. The people in the stand cry out for justice and his execution. Jaxarak felt safe. What can some apes do? His judgment is death! Jaxarak laughed. How can you kill an immortal? Mary smiled, and Jaxarak fell silent. A cheap 3,000 credit time capsule and empty space. Jaxarak pieces punishment together as if the realization hit. No, 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 he shouted as he tried to free himself of his restraints. Mary looked to the crowd. An immortal cannot be killed conventionally. Luckily, us humans have known how to kill unconventionally. He will be sealed in an airtight time capsule and sent into space. By the air runs out, he will be in the void between galaxies where barely any ship is willing to go through. His body will have no oxygen, so no energy, no food. He will die. His cells will die. His soul shall face hell. And all the hands that will grab him will be the hands of those he has slaughtered wrongfully. Jaxarak cried out, Mercy! Please! Mary smacked her hammer on the desk. Carry the order executioner. The last thing Jaxarak saw before his body permanently died, and if this soulless monster even had one, his spirit will meet his retribution. Was the cheering of the crowd cheering on his death in the human woman's cold, empathetic face, as if he was just a footnote in her life while he has lived a hundred lifetimes more than her? So now immortals tend to keep to themselves or are in permanent hiding. Story 3 The enemy captain had the human trapped. No teleportation, no electric equipment, no fancy schmancy technological tool could work. He looked at the human, now human. Before I torture you, entertain my ears. How does it feel to be trapped? The human takes off his helmet. The cameras do not work, so it's better to see. The captain looked on the human. No fear. Typical of their race when cornered. Now, now, I need information on your fleet, from its armaments to its captains. You will provide these after I have my way with you and don't think about escaping. No technology works in this room I trapped you in. No teleportation, no nanite weapons, no blasters. The human looked at his energy sword. He tried to turn it on, but no energy came out of it. He tried his ranged teleporter. No systems on his suit worked. The captain laughs. See, now surrender, and I'll maybe choose to not amputate all four of your limbs. The human cracked his neck. So no tech works in this room, correct? The captain smiled. Yes, no weapons. The human checks his hands. The armored gauntlets were still in good shape and he chooses to sigh. The armorer is gonna be pissed about these gauntlets, he says, sheathing his energy sword handle back in its holster on his hip. What about your precious gauntlets, the captain says. I know your race loves duels, but your species love to restrain your prey by removing all their energy weapons correct. The captain laughs insultingly. Of course, the feeling of defeating a weakened opponent brings me great joy, the human cracks his knuckles. I cannot teleport. My blaster doesn't work. I should have brought a gun. Oh well, I still got my gauntlets. Power gauntlets. No energy or force weapon works. No, just normal gauntlets. Padded too, so these will hurt you and not break my hands. The captain slowly realizes his situation. He is stuck in a room with a human. A human. The human walks closer to the captain, cracking his knuckles and flexing his fingers. You forget, Captain Lucius, torturer and butcher of the Rilaki Strait, that while I, a mere human, have no energy weapons, I still have the most simple weapon of all. The human grabs the enemy captain with one hand, gripping his face, 
As his other hand winds up, the hard, slightly serrated with spiked fingers is turned into a tight fist. I am the weapon, 